We're in Samuel. Turn there with me, 1 Samuel chapter 19. Kids, you're dismissed for Children's Church. We are together in the book of Samuel. It looks like we're going to continue through this book uh, through the summer, unless the Lord direct us in a different way. Um, and um, we're just going to, we usually do series, some series in the summer, but uh, we're going to uh, continue to exposit and preach through Samuel uh, is the direction we're headed in. So we're in 1 Samuel chapter 19 is where we're at. So you can turn your Bibles there. We'll get there in a moment. We'll read through the text as we go through the sermon. So o- over the past few weeks, over the past few chapters, we've been watching the, the first king of Israel, his name is Saul, go from his anointing of oil by Samuel the prophet, and then the Spirit of God, you remember, rushing upon him, empowering him for the task of, of his kingship, to now his murderous actions against the newly appointed anointed king of Israel. Always keep in mind, always keep in mind in this transition that Saul was anointed king partly as God's judgment on Israel. Uh, because of their rebellion, because of their desire and their decision to want a king of their own choosing. God gave them a job description. They didn't want to hear it, and they wanted a king that they wanted. And now we've been witnessing this downward spiral of, of the king, King Saul, and the emergence, as we saw the past couple of weeks, the emergence of, of the king that God did choose for Israel. His name is David, the second king of Israel. If you remember, David is the youngest of eight sons of Jesse. He was not at the sacrificial meal when they came together, when the, 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 the well-known itinerant, itinerant prophet Samuel came to town. Uh, he had to go, they had to go get him. He was out in the flock, out on, on the field uh, caring for the flock. And then this semi-private kind of anointing, he's called in, he's the youngest son, and Samuel anoints him with oil, and we read that the Spirit of God rushed upon, or the Spirit of God came upon David as well. And only the family understood, I don't even think, I really don't think even the family understood at that time, he's a young boy, what was happening. So keep that in mind, as this transition from King Saul to King David, I think at this moment, I don't think the family really understands the entire uh, um, reality of what's, what's going on at this point. And we see that because David, after his anointing, we see David was called on to serve and to go to the king's court, go to Saul, the king's uh, um, service by playing his lyre. If you remember, he played a lyre, and Saul was under attack by 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 an evil, or maybe you have a a different word, a um, harmful spirit, because the spirit of the Lord was taken from him, an evil spirit or a harmful spirit of the Lord was given to him. Chapter 16. <clears throat> Chapter 17, David emerges. You remember, he fights Goliath, right? By faith, he takes Goliath the giant out, and Israel defeats, not annihilates, but defeats the Philistines. And we read that, if you remember the story, I'm sure you do. <clears throat> David fought Goliath as a representative of Israel, pointing to the greater and the better representative, his name is King Jesus, you remember the story, right? So we're weak Israel, we're desperately in need of a valiant warrior to fight for them, to fight as them, and the story is to trust Jesus, Jesus Christ alone, the the true son of David. On the cross, he he vicariously, substitutionarily fought against our enemies of sin, Satan, and death, rose victorious over sin, empowers us with the Spirit of God to continue to live for him. Last week, you remember Chris did a great job, Pastor Chris did a great job teaching us about Jonathan. Remember, Jonathan now is on the scene. He was on the scene before, but now he's on the scene again. He's Saul's son, and Jonathan and David's heart is knit together in a deep friendship. We saw how the real base of friendship he mentioned last week was a mutual love for God, a shared devotion of God's glory, a faith in God and the power of God to save his people. Jonathan invites David in, they have a covenant together, he gives him his robe, his armor, his bow, his belt, his sword, he's honoring David who's the inferior, uh, and, and Saul's son, Jonathan, really was supposed to be next to the kingdom, but he was not, obviously, and, and Jonathan recognized that God was with David, he humbly surrenders, he humbly and willingly surrenders his royal rights, his privileges, as he gives his armor over, Jonathan gives armor over to the new king of God's choice, and his name is David. But Samuel's not happy. And Samuel's getting more and more jealous. Samuel's, excuse me, Saul's getting more and more jealous. Saul's getting more and more fearful. Remember last week, twice he tries to throw a spear and kill David. He's hunting him like an animal. In chapter 18, verse 14, though, in the goodness of God, David has success. The Lord is with him. David is growing in, 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 in his uh, view in, in the eyes of people. But 
Saul is fearful. Saul is jealous. Saul is not only jealous, Saul is paranoid. He's used his, his daughters, you remember from last week as well. And at the end of the chapter, Saul marries off his daughter, Michael, to David for the price of a hundred foreskins, if you remember. I think it's a good principle if you want to marry one of my daughters. I think it's a great. <laughs> a chance of you getting killed is pretty good, so I'm, I'm, I'm looking well. We've got a lot to say about that, but we'll move on. Chapter 18, verse 28, at the end it says, Saul saw and knew that the Lord was with David. He recognizes that. And that Michael, his daughter loved him. The Lord loves him. My daughter loves him. Saul was even more afraid of David. Verse 29. So Saul was David's enemy continually. Not the other way around. Saul was David's enemy continually. Verse 29. Verse 30. Then the commanders of the Philistines came out to battle as often as they came. And David had more success than all the servants of Saul so that his name was highly esteemed. So you see the story as we pick it up. Saul is getting angrier, more jealous, more paranoid, more murderous. Saul is. David is growing in esteem. Tries to kill him. And we're going to see he's going to try to kill him now. I mean, he's using his family. He's using his own people. He's even using the Philistines to try to take out David. That's how bad Saul has gotten. We jump into chapter 19, though, as well as we look at that. There's going to be four more attempts. There are going to be four more We'll call them acts, or we'll call them uh, scenes. Very clearly, our, our outline is really clear. Four scenes, four acts in this narrative where David is trying to be, uh, Saul is trying to kill David, and David escapes four times. So it's really a simple outline. We see each one of them. First, we'll see David's delivered by Jonathan's appeal. Jonathan will appeal to his father. He's delivered by David's ability. He gets out of the way of another attempt on his life. Delivered by Michael's actions, the daughter of Saul and the sister of Jonathan, right? And delivered by God's activity. So really simple outline. Four escapes on the life, on the, on the murderous plot and the hit on David. Okay? That's where we're at. Chapter 19, verse 1. Saul spoke to Jonathan, his son, and to all his servants that they should Kill David. Remember, David is growing in esteem. Saul is getting more and more crazy. But Jonathan, right? Saul's son delighted much in David. And Jonathan told David, Saul, my father, seeks to kill you. Therefore, be on your guard in the morning. Stay in a secret place and hide yourself. And I will go and stand beside my father in the field where you are. And I'll speak to my dad about you. And if I learn anything, I will tell you. And Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father, and said to him, Let not the king sin against his servant David, because he has not sinned against you, because his deeds have brought good to you. For he took his life in his own hands, and he struck down the Philistines. And the Lord worked a great salvation for all of Israel. You saw it and rejoiced. Why then will you sin against innocent blood by killing David without a cause? Saul listened to the voice of Jonathan. Saul swore, as the Lord lives, he shall not be put to death. And Jonathan called David and reported to him all these things. And Jonathan brought David to Saul, and he was in his presence as before. God had a blessing to the reading of his word. One thing we should note as we jump into this text, one thing I think we ought to see is that when you think, when you and I think, when people think that they can thwart the sovereign plan and purpose of God, you will, I will be disappointed. The story is about a conflict, a conflict of two wills. Uh, and just like a small child, if their parents are doing their job correctly, and they're going to come up and butt up against the father or the mother's will, and they're going to know what will, will prevail. Saul is fighting the clear, sovereign providential hand of God. God has declared that he will not be king. The kingdom will be taken from him and given to somebody else. It won't be Jonathan. It'll be another person. Saul has rejected God. God has rejected him. On the one hand, we have, on the one hand, we have God, the creator, the sovereign ruler over all. On the other hand, we have our, our human wills that, it, that is consistently and continually against the Lord. It is only by the gospel. It is only by the gospel, family. It is only by the gospel. 
power of the gospel that we as human beings can submit to the will of God. That we are in compliance with that in which God wants. Where we submit to the salvation and lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is the gospel and the gospel alone that calls us for a change. To take, to take that broken relationship and be reconciled to our God. Make no mistake. This narrative in all of scripture is about the providence of God in the life of his people. Everything that happens, happens because God sovereignly wills it to happen. And wills it to happen before it happens and wills it to happen the way it happens. Saul will learn the hard way. Does that mean that, that we don't have a choice? No. Does that mean that we don't have an opportunity to make decisions? No. Well, then I don't understand. Okay. God is sovereign. We have choices to make. If you can't figure it out, it's because your name is not Elohim. So he saw, calls this meeting, he calls his servants, he calls those involved, he calls his personal servants, his sons, and he draws them, he's, he's drawing them into this murderous conspiracy. I want him dead. But immediately the narrator makes it really clear that David was, that, that David and Jonathan were, Hearts were knit together. You see what it says in verse, in verse 1. Verse 2, Saul's son delighted much in David, right? And it's interesting because in chapter 18, verse 22, it, it, it says that, behold, the king, use the same word, has delighted in David. That was a lie. Here it says, Jonathan's soul, son delighted much in David. That was the truth. But as we've seen last week, even though they made a covenant, even though their hearts were knit together, sometimes that stuff, that kind of relationship is put to the test. So, yeah, there's a covenant. Yeah, their hearts were knit together. But let's see where the rubber hits the road, if that's true. Will Jonathan be faithful to his promise? Will Jonathan be faithful and protect David from his father, the king? And the answer is yes. He hears his father's words and he tells David about the hit. And he sends him away secretly and, and puts him in a safe place until he could talk to his father and find out what's going on. And notice how Jonathan, the man of faith, appeals to his dad. He appeals to him through two ways. He does it through the, the word of God and through the work of God, right? Through the word of God and through the work of God. He tells David, he tells his father, Jonathan tells Saul, David does not deserve to die. There's a law about death. In fact, if he puts him to death, he's sinning against the law of God. In fact, Deuteronomy 19 says, if you take the life of, of an innocent one, an innocent blood, retribution and action is required upon you. Saul has no justification at all for his violence and his intent to kill. Look what it says in verse 5. He is without cause. A bold speech by a son to his father. And I, I would say a spirit-filled confrontation. Jonathan is a man of faith. He doesn't miss, mince words, right? He says, let the king not sin against your servant, David. Now, if you do a little research on the word sin, just in Samuel alone, you'll find out that it's not thrown around the book lightly. If you remember chapter 2, we read about the sin of Eli, the high priest's worthless, abusing, strong-armed, manipulating sons. I try to get it all in there because that's where they are. Remember also the terrible day of Gilgal when, when Saul spared King Agag of the best of the sheep and he disobeyed and he was take, the kingdom was taken and he was forced to confess, I have sinned, he said to Samuel. Then in chapter 7, verse 6, the idolatry of the people and they, 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 they confessed their sin, they repent of their sin of idolatry in Mizpah in chapter 7. And we read throughout our context that Israel was sinning against the Lord for asking for the king that they wanted, chapter 12. And now we see Jonathan confronting Saul who wants to add to that sin of Israel. Jonathan pleaded, don't sin against David. He didn't sin against you, but rather he brought good to you. First he hits him with the word, then he mentions the work of God. Like, just a little bit deeper. You saw what he did with Goliath. Nobody wanted to fight that monster. You saw what David did. He put his own life at risk. You saw what the Lord did. He did a great work of salvation on David. In fact, Dad, you rejoiced in it, it says. Jonathan's stepping it up. He's really a friend who loves, him, who loves his neighbor as himself. 
He puts himself in the way of death. Remember, the king could take anyone's life. He's the law of the land. But Jonathan also, if you notice, if you read that speech, he's also not only faithful, but there's a respect and submission to his father as well, I think. He appeals for David's life. He appeals to the father to do what is right. He reminds them that David is a devoted servant whose actions have always benefited King Saul. Quite a speech. You know what else? As I was reading this text, I'm thinking that was also a word of grace. I love to point out grace in the Old Testament. People say, I don't know grace in the Old Testament. There's so much grace in the Old Testament. The word of God came back to the king. No, it wasn't a new word through the prophet, but it was a word that came through his son. Don't do this, lad, dad. You know the law. You know what it says. Don't do this. He's even reminded of the work of God and the great salvation God brought to Israel. And the grace of God that came to the king, although it was momentarily, brought him back to some sort of reality. Saul says he listened. Excuse me, the word says that he listened, literally obeyed Jonathan and took a solemn oath that David would not be put to death. A promise, yes, he quickly and conveniently disregarded. But in the meantime, it was an oath he made, and David now is brought back into the service of the king. If you're here this morning, listen. Listen, audio down the road. The question for us this morning is, will you obey the word of God? Will you respond to the work of God. Family, will you obey the word of God? Will you respond to the work of God? The apostle John tells us that Jesus is the word who became flesh and he dwells among us full of grace and truth. In John chapter 6, listen to this. Jesus is talking to them. He's talking about being the bread of life. Truly, truly, I say to you that you're seeking me not because you saw signs, because you ate the loaves and you're full. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man, Jesus himself, will give to you. For on him will give to you, yeah, for you. For on him, God the Father has set his seal. And they said to him, what must we, what, 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 what must we do to do the works of God? Jesus answered him, this is the work of God, that you believe in him who was sent. That you believe in him who was sent. The work of God is to respond to what God is already doing, the work of God. God is already doing in the proclaiming and the preaching of the gospel. To respond in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ. Jonathan is standing before the king. He's advocating for innocent David. He has done nothing wrong yet. Pleading his case before the father, King Saul. You know, in 1 John chapter 2, chapter 2 tells us that the truly innocent one stands before God the Father, before the cosmic courtroom where he is truly advocating for the truly guilty sinners like us. It says he's the advocate, that we have an advocate, sinners have an advocate, not just simply in words, but through the cross. John tells us that sinners have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, the righteous, he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. This points to Jesus. Jesus pleading not our innocence, but his, his righteousness. Yes, it's true that genuine friendship involves loyalty and at times advocacy, but family, the greatest need you have is a friend in Jesus. The greatest need you have and advocacy you have is faith in Jesus, the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not our unjust judgment, but his judgment and wrath-absorbing sacrifice in our place. We stand guilty, and Jesus stands as our advocate, as our propitiatory sacrifice, taking the wrath we deserve upon himself. Do you know that word from God? Do you know that work that God is calling us to believe, the work that he's already doing? Is Jesus your advocate before the Father? I pray that you'll leave here today trusting in Jesus. 1 Peter 3.18, Christ suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, you know which one you are, and I am, that he might bring us to God. 
delivered by Jonathan. Look at, look at verse 8, delivered by David's ability. Verse 8, and there was war again. And David went out and fought with the Philistines and struck them with a great blow so that they fled before him. Then a harmful spirit from the Lord came upon Saul and he sat in his house with his spear in his hand. And David was playing the lyre. And Saul sought to pin David to the wall with the spear, but he eluded Saul. So that he struck the spear into the wall and David fled and escaped that night. So David goes back to the king's house, right? Back to the service, and then he's sent right out on mission. He's, he's, he's a valiant warrior, and he does what warriors do and kings do. He fights God's enemy. And his brief description of him going to the battlefield is just a, 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 a kind, of, uh, uh, kind of showing us that he is now again gaining national attention. Remember chapter 18, he ends with being highly esteemed. And they were, if you remember from last week too, they were singing a song. The ladies were coming out and singing. Uh, Saul has struck down thousands and David is ten thousands. David comes back from the war and he walks in his room and he returns to a crazy man. <laughs> he meets a crazy man who has a spear in his hand. I think it's safe to say if anyone's trying to kill you on a regular basis and you go into their home and he's got a giant spear in his hand, there's only one thing to do. Run, Forrest, run. Right, Exactly. Ralph Bergen, in his commentary, says this. I love it. He says, the spear in his hand served as a clear indication that Saul was having problems. You think? Only a deeply troubled individual would sit around, armed, for war inside the safest house in Israel. End quote. It's the third time we've been told that a harmful spirit is afflicting him. At, at least, I, I think the narrator tells us that because it's in part showing us how bad Saul has really become. I don't think it's, it's not my fault. It's this, it's, this, it's this harmful spirit. But remember, the spirit was, the Holy Spirit, the spirit of God was taken from Saul and the evil and the harmful spirit was given to him as a judgment against him in his, in his disobedience and his refusal to submit to God. One was taken, one was given. And previously, every time David played the lyre, the, the spirit would leave. But now, maybe because of jealousy, maybe because of anger, maybe because of, of paranoia, the spirit comes and the, the door is open, right? And he's, and he's continuing to terrorize Saul. He, he doesn't, it doesn't calm him down here. Family, when we surrender to, to anger, we surrender to our, our self-control to anger and greed, drugs, immorality, sexual immorality, especially unforgiveness, Listen, we open ourselves up to evil influences, harmful evil influences. The Apostle Paul writes this to the Ephesian church. Be angry, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. That word opportunity means a place that is marked off, literally a, 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 an open door of opportunity. The enemy just loves it when we hold on to bitterness. Jealousy, anger, unforgiveness. And as the story goes, his vow not to kill David evaporates. I mean, think about it. The only thing that has happened so far is David's come back to the court and he's beat the enemies of Israel. And Saul is still filled with anger, jealousy, and he throws a spear at David. And David, in his quick ability, gets out of the way. This time he fled. This time when he flees, he's never going to return into the court like this ever again. And unlike the previous uh, similar incident, David did not remain in his presence, but he is kept and then dropped. We'll see. He goes out the window and down and he, and he, and he flees. And what's really cool about this, I want, I want to point this out to you. In verse 8, look at verse 8 with me. It says that David struck them, meaning the Philistines, so that they fled. You see that in verse 8? Now look at verse 10. In verse 10, Saul throws the spear at David and struck the spear to the wall and David fled. Same Hebrew verbs. Okay, same Hebrew verbs. You see the irony? David, the victor over the Philistines, is treated like a Philistine. One more thing. David had enough. David had enough. The crazy, rather extreme, abusive relationship that he was in with this king was something that he said enough and he walks away. 
And I want to be very careful here, but I want to be also honest with you. I think it's appropriate to say at this point that sometimes relationships that are that bad, that are that abusive, that are, are wreaking that much havoc, the only option may be for you today is to remove yourself from that situation. I, I don't believe God has given everyone a free pass to break any relationship they want. That's not what I'm saying. So, so, so I will say this cautiously, but honestly, if you believe you're in a severe abusive relation, physical, emotional, spiritual abuse, listen, seek biblical help. Seek help from your leaders. Call one of the pastors. Seek biblical counseling. Be honest. Tell the whole story. Don't make decisions in a vacuum. Yes, there are those who take minor incidents and call it abuse. We abuse the word abuse. That's true. Yet there are those I've met that are living in such horrible situations that are so caught up in it they can't see the abuse. Seek help. Seek wisdom. Seek godly counsel. Seek truth. And most of all, seek God and his word. And, and I think what we're seeing here is David is removing himself from a crazy spear-wielding lunatic and saying, I'm done with that. Sometimes enough is enough. Seek help. Jonathan's appeal, David's ability. Look at, look at Michelle, Michael, action, verse 11. Saul sends messenger to David's house. All right. He want to flee? Good, we get him. I'm going to kill him in the morning, verse 11. But Michael's David's wife told him, listen, if you don't escape with your life tonight, tomorrow you're going to be you're dead. You'll be killed. So Michael let David down through the window, and he fled away and escaped. Verse 13, Michael took an image, right, we have deception here, and laid it on a bed and put a pillow of goat's hair at its head and covered it with the clothes, like a jailbreak, right? And when Saul sent messenger to David, she said to her father, he is sick. Lie number one. Then Saul sent the messenger to see David, saying, bring him to me in his bed, and I will kill him. I mean, he's just, he's out there. And when the messengers came in, behold, the image was in the bed and the pillars of goat hair at its head. Saul said to Michael, why have you deceived me and thus let my enemy go so that he has escaped? And Michael answered to Saul, he said to me, let me go. Why should I kill you? Lie number two. I mean, what a scene, right? <laughs> David, again, the prime target of Saul's hatred. And only this time, it's not Jonathan, the son of the king. It is the daughter of the king, Jonathan's sister, David's wife, Michael, who comes to the rescue. This is a movie plot, man. This is, this is, this is the house is under surveillance. You know, Michael enables him to, to escape out the window, reminds us of Rahab. Remember in the book of Genesis, it did in the spies of Jericho in, in the first five books. And she delays it, gives him a little bit of time to escape by putting, what does it say there? An image. Terapim in the Hebrew, and, and he's sick. Same word used in Genesis 3.19 where Rachel, if you remember the story, stole her father's household gods. The reason that is because the word is idol. She took a household idol and put it in the bed. And what is also really interesting about this Hebrew word, when Saul rebelled against God by not taking Agag the king out, as he was told in chapter 15, the word of the Lord says about Saul's rebellion this. For rebellion is a sin of divination and presumption is as iniquity and idolatry. Same word. That's used of Saul. We're not told why she had this idol laying around the house. It was probably didn't mean a whole lot to her. She was going to use it as a dummy and put some hair on its head. But what's interesting, and I don't have time to get into this, but you can mark it down. Psalm 59 I'm going to read a little bit of it, but remember Psalm 59. Psalm 59 was written by King David during this escape. Okay, during this escape. And, and, and there's no mention of Michael, his wife, in it. Actually, even though Saul was trying to kill him and his daughter, his daughter and David's wife helped, it says God's strength and love will preserve him. Michael's loving wife, like a brother with the human agents, Helping David rescue, but it was God's providence. It was God's sovereignty was the ultimate reason for his deliverance. Listen to just a couple of verses, okay? Psalm 59. 
This incident, this is when he writes this. Deliver me from my enemies, O my God. Protect me from those who rise up against me. For behold, they lie in wait for my life. Fierce men stir up strife against me. For no transgression or sin of mine, O Lord. For no fault of mine. Awake, Lord, come to me and see. O my strength, I'll watch for you. For you, O God, my fortress. My God in his steadfast love will meet me. God will let me look in triumph over my enemies. I will sing of your strength. I will sing aloud of your steadfast love in the morning. For you have been to me a fortress and a refuge in the day of my distress. Oh, my strength. I will sing praises to you for you, O Lord. For you, O God, are my fortress. The God who shows me steadfast love. God's steadfast love is a fortress to David. In the midst of God's difficult providence, David is resting in the strength, in the goodness, in the steadfast love as a fortress. That's where we need to be. Amen? Now, let's, let's, just, let's just mention something. We've got two lies going on in the deception. It's not the first time somebody in the Bible lied and helped the people of God, right? The biblical narrative, I mentioned this before, doesn't say... That was good or bad. It doesn't say, and Michael lied twice to her father, and the Lord looked down on her and blessed her a hundredfold because of her wonderful lie. It was a good idea. It doesn't say that. Right? Remember Rahab, again, you know the story. She lets the men down, the spies, and they escape. David will do the same thing in 1 uh, 1 Samuel. David's going to lie to the Philistines. So we need to just talk about this for a minute, all right? A couple things. Because some of you kids are here. You shouldn't be lying to your parents because it's in the Bible. I'll tell you that right now. The Bible places a high value on truth and truthfulness, right? Lies and deception are understood to be wrong, sinful, and evil. Samuel had said earlier, the glory of Israel will not lie, 1 Samuel 15. We ought to take seriously the fact that God does not lie, right? God does not lie. He does not want us to lie. Number two, it's important to note that each one of these incidences, the one who lied was the weak one, the one that was threatened by a more powerful enemy. It may be that in extreme circumstances, the weaker and threatened party may be somewhat, we're going to talk about this in a minute, justified in the defense of telling a lie to an enemy. But we can't just push this under the rug, sweep this under the rug. The, the characters who lie in Scripture, it simply tells us what they are doing. Whether we would ever be justified like them or do it and be somewhat right is another question, right? It should be stated, I think, really clearly that such extreme ethical dilemmas, that's what this is, an ethical dilemma is very rare for American Christians today. Not in this circumstances. Certainly, God's people should be people of truth. They should love the truth. They should hate lies, hate violence, and sometimes even required of it. The actions of of Jonathan and Michael would suggest it's possible to accept the guilt of lying, which is a sin, in order to accomplish a higher good. Let, let 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 me just ask you a question, and you don't have to answer it out loud. Suppose, suppose our government, or suppose a government, was going to come in and take your child. Suppose a government said, no children will be born ever again. Suppose you're in Nazi Germany and you got three little children hidden, Jewish children hidden, and and they come to your house, knock on the door, and they say, give us the children if you have any. Do you have any children here? What would you say? If you say no, you're a liar or you lied. If you say yes, three innocent children are dead. That's the extreme we're talking about. Right? Right? Not, did you take that from, uh, did you fall asleep on the job? Did you, did you take, that's not what we're talking about. What time did you get home last night? Oh, I got home early, you know what I mean? We're not talking about that. Kids, Dr. Derek Thomas said this, her faith is demonstrated in what she actually did. And it seems to me that sometimes in the providence of God, we may well find ourselves in circumstances where to do the loving thing for our neighbor may well involve doing something that is ethically and morally questionable, end quote. Is lying a sin? Yes. We find ourselves in a very rare place 
very rare place to love our neighbors. He says, and, he, and this is coming from Derek Thomas as well. I think he's got it right on. He said we must run to Jesus and confess that sin and ask him to forgive us with an attitude and perspective of hope that someday, and, and with a perspective of hope that someday we'll get rid of this sin-cursed world, this hopeless, ungodly world, and bring us into a new heaven and a new earth. They just have that attitude of brokenness. Okay? Lastly, Jonathan's appeal, David's ability, Michael's actions, delivered by God's activity. Verse 18, David fled and he escaped. He came to Samuel at Ramah and he told all that Saul was going to do to him. And he and Samuel went and lived in Naoth. And it was told to Saul, behold, David is at Naoth in Ramah. And Saul sent messengers to David. And when they saw the company of prophets prophesying, Samuel standing his head over them, the Spirit of God came upon the messengers of Saul. And they also prophesied. Remember, we're not talking about New Testament here. Don't read New Testament understanding in this. Verse 21, when it was told Saul what happened, he sent other messengers, and they also prophesied. And Saul sent messengers again a third time, and they also prophesied. Verse 22, then he himself went to Ramah and came to the great well that is in Siku, and he asked, where are Samuel and David? And one told him, behold, they're at Namath in, in, in Ramah. And he went there to Naoth in Ramah. And the Spirit of God came upon him also. And he went and he prophesied until he came to Naoth in Ramah. And he too stripped off his clothes. And he too prophesied before Samuel. And they and lay naked all that day and all that night. Thus it was said, is Saul also among the prophets? David thought in time of crisis, in time of running for my life, in time of very difficulty, in time of the, of the hard things in life, what I need to do is seek the man of God. Seek the word of God. Let me go seek out Samuel. He's only, uh, I, from what I understand, a short distance away, maybe an hour or two walk from where he was. And David went first to Samuel. He meets him, and then Samuel takes David to a place called Naoth, which means dwelling or tents. It could be like a Glenmont within Bethlehem, or it could be just a place where Samuel would train prophets. I think that's probably what it was. Anyway, they, they, they get there, and, and I really think that, that David was seeking God, was seeking the word of God, was seeking the man of God, and that David was, was refreshed, right? I mean, he's meeting with Samuel. He's taking him to the place where the prophets are. When prophecy means they're, they're praising the Lord probably more than anything. They're not going, on Thursday it's going to rain at 4 o'clock, right? They're praising the Lord, and he's getting nurtured. He's getting fellowship. He's getting help. He's taking advantage of the man of God that's only moments away. And the word, and the narrative tells us that uh, the word reaches Saul, and he sends people to David. And, and they get there, they see the prophets prophesying, Samuel standing over them, training them, and there's this place of prophecy, and the messengers start praising and prophesying. Amazing. And, and the very people who were sent to arrest him are now under the control of God, and they're praising God. Saul hears it and is like, all right, oh man, that didn't really work. Let me send someone else. Then he's dead, this doesn't work. They stop prophesying and praising God. They're supposed to bring David back so he can kill him. And right, let me try a third time. Third's a charm, right? They start prophesying. So what does he do? I got to go do this myself. And he goes himself. He arrives at Ramah. He says, she's at a well. He's like, you know where these guys are. We're not talking a big prop. We're not talking a, a far distance here. And they're like, yeah, we know where he is. He's at Naoth and Ramah. And he goes there. The Spirit of God comes upon him, and he starts prophesying on his way to the place where they are. And when he gets there, look what it says. The Spirit of God overcomes him, and he gets naked. He strips his clothes. He's naked before Samuel all day, all night. A grave shame in uh, ancient Near East. And notice how the Spirit of prophecy, which came upon Saul, if you remember, in his confirming, in his calling in 1 Samuel chapter 10, is now blocking him from sinning, from going against the Lord's anointed. All right? It could be no clear proof of the ambiguity of what it means to be rushed on by the Spirit. God uses his Spirit as he chooses. And Saul's loss of his royal attire, stripping naked in the presence of God, in the presence of God's man, Samuel, it presents a powerful image confirming the prophetic judgment that was made against 
Saul by Samuel, that your kingdom will be stripped from you, he said in chapter 15. God has rejected Saul as king. So in God's presence, Saul will not be permitted to wear his royal robe. And the narration ends, is Saul among the prophets? Does that sound familiar? It links the incident, this incident, with the first incident of the anointing of when the Spirit first came upon him in chapter 10. The same question was asked. The question first asked in chapter 10, because they've seen this unknown farm boy with this very well-known prophet, and they asked the question, is this one of the prophets? When the Spirit of the Lord had marked him out, the Spirit of the Lord had empowered him, and he was chosen king. That was back in chapter 10. Now, look at the irony of the question. I think it challenges the genuineness of Saul's prophetic behavior and the legitimacy of his kingship in Israel. It's almost if God said the first prophecy, you'll be rushed on by the Spirit to confirm it, and now you're going to be rushed on the Spirit because your kingdom has come to an end. And we're going to see that shortly. God has rescued David, not by any intermediary work of man, but by his overpowering influence by his spirit. He sends three groups, the king goes himself, and he, all three groups, including the king, wind up serving the Lord and praising the Lord. Yes, God uses people. Yes, God uses a, a Jonathan, a Micah, to provide protection. But sometimes he bypasses all that so that the world will know that salvation is of the Lord. The means of deliverance, listen, the means of deliverance may, should never obscure. The means of deliverance should never obscure the source. The one who's behind it all. The one who is truly doing the deliverance. And sometimes the deliverer God himself wants to make it perfectly clear. I mean, this whole story is such a discombobulated mess, but there is one clear thing we learn. David was not forsaken. David was not forsaken. David, even though he was in a hard place, even though the providence of God was hard in his life at that moment, he was not abandoned. Ralph David writes this, sometimes the clearest evidence that God has not deserted you is not that you are successfully past your trial, but that you are still on your feet in the middle of it, end quote. Listen, none of you here are going to be the next king of Israel. If you think you are, come and see me after the service. But we can be confident of the providence of God. We can trust God while things are hard. L listen. We can be confident that God will keep us until whatever he has decreed, ordained for me to be, or for you and I to, to accomplish. Psalm 2. He who sits in the heaven laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak in them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. God will not be mocked. Those who set themselves against the Lord's anointed will not prevail. They will be overthrown just as Saul and his men were stripped naked before the prophet of God. Now, let me close this way. Can you imagine, try to imagine if you can, David seeking the wise counsel, the mature counsel of Samuel. Can, can you imagine him going to Samuel and saying, Samuel, you anointed me with oil. The Spirit of God came upon me. Listen, ever since then, people are trying to kill me. What is going on? What is God doing? Is this the providence of God? And Samuel might have taken his old hand, his wrinkled hand on the boy's shoulder and said, I can't tell you everything God is doing, but what I can tell you is this. He knows what he's doing. He knows the beginning from the end. Family, you got to realize David's family will preach, will, will, will bring us to Jesus. But before that, David is Ruth's grandson. This is Naomi's great-grandson. Naomi, she flee from Bethlehem with, her, uh, with her, her husband because of a famine. And then she's brought back from Moab, remember? And, and what happened? She came back and she said, don't call me Naomi. Call me what? Mara. Bitter. Why? For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me, she says. I went away full. Her husband and son's dead. But the Lord brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? 
The providence of her life was harsh. It was hard. It was bitter. It dealt a severe blow. And God, in his inscrutable providence, may have brought us through or in right now hard places. Hard places he brought David through. Maybe something different, maybe something alike. Whatever hard place you may be in, but God is in absolute control. You and I can trust him. On the night when Jesus was betrayed, he went out to the garden, you remember, the Garden of Gethsemane. He takes Peter, James, and John with him. And it says he began to be greatly distressed. The word is terrified, surprised, and then very sorrowful, meaning overcome with horror. And going a little further, he fell to the ground, he prayed. If it were possible, he says to his father, the hour might pass from me. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not I will, but what you will. Listen, Jesus, the true and better king, was hated and betrayed and not only sought after by murderous men, he was arrested and murdered and put to the most cruelest death imaginable, crucifixion. And family on the cross, the cup, what he's beginning to experience in the garden, what he will fully experience on the cross, taking the wrath of God in our place for our sins, was the very providence of God his Father. Jesus, the true and better king, endured the providence of God. And Peter tells us when he suffered, he didn't threaten. He continued entrusting himself to his Father, who judges justly. And he then himself bore our sins In the body, on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. Scripture and history shows us that God himself actually identified with our pain, suffering, and death in the person of Jesus Christ. He walked this earth perfectly. He lived a perfect life, suffered betrayal and abandonment, being tortured on a Roman cross. And on that night, on that day, he hung. And darkness overcome the whole hill of Golgotha. And the father turned his face on his son. And the eternal relationship of the father and the son was broken in a way we will never understand. And he cried out, Psalm 22, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And then he died, tasting death for us all. Listen, when you look at the providence of God in the life of Jesus and at the cross, it may not answer all your questions why the hard providences of God have come into your life, but... We know what the reason is not. We know that the reason is not that he abandoned you. We know that the reason is not that he doesn't love you. He has not abandoned you. He abandoned Jesus and he bore our wrath so that he will never leave us nor forsake us. Family, trust him this morning. Seek him this morning. And this communion table reminds us of the, of the hard, long road of Calvary, of the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ, all that he endured, entrusting himself to the Father so that you can always know, always, always know his eternal love. You can always also know that God's eternal plans for you are always for your good and for his glory. For those who call him, Right, all things work together for the good. For those who called, who are those who have been called according to his love and purposes. Father, as we take on communion this morning, Father, as we gather, as the band plays, as we, as we reflect, as we confess our sins, God, help us to trust you more. Help us to run to you, Lord Jesus. Spirit of God, open our hearts and minds to see the things we ought to confess and turn from. And Father, may we at that point truly celebrate, not because we've earned it, but because you graciously call us to take of the bread and drink of the cup, reminding us of what was done for our sins. As Jesus Christ bore our sin, the wrath we deserve upon himself. He is our true representative. He is our true advocate. And Father, we come humbly by faith in what Jesus has accomplished and not by anything we have done. We confess, we repent, and we celebrate your eternal love. Love that's not deserved, but love that is absolutely pours out from Calvary for those who are willing to receive it. Father, we pray that we are. Help us this morning in Jesus' name.